Davidson, a leader who certainly understands the challenges the Joint Force faces in today's dynamic environment and the things we need to be thinking about. If you have any questions for Admiral Davidson, please text them to the address located on the screens and they'll be provided after today's presentation. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome to the Commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Philip S. Davidson. Uh, it's now afternoon. Aloha, everyone. How are you today? It's good to see you. For those of you who are not from the islands, it's uh, great to see you here today. The weather has cooperated. It has been some of the most miserable weather we've had here uh, in the five months I've been assigned as uh, the Pacific Command Commander that I can imagine. When you look at Diamond Head, it is absolutely green. That is not Diamond Head's natural state. So you are, the, you are the beneficiary of some ill weather, but it's just absolutely glorious out there right now and should be here for the remainder of the week. I want to say thank you to the Hilton Hawaiian Village for hosting this event again this year. Uh, did a great job. There's more people here this year, more exhibits. They've actually spilled out in the hallway out here where we don't usually have folks. And I want to thank AFCIA for inviting me to speak today and, and I want to thank AFCIA for continuing to host this event, focusing on defense issues in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'd be remiss if I also didn't thank Admiral Dick Mackey, of course, uh, Lieutenant General Bob Shea of AFCIA International, and uh, Mr. Jim Mueller of AFCIA Hawaii, uh, and all the sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, a special shout out to Mr. Uh, Whiting, who I know could not be here today of Titania, and my own Lieutenant uh, Colonel Elborn. Where are you, Colonel? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Elborn uh, of my staff, who does so much. It's great seeing industry, academia, service members from several nations represented in this conference to discuss the challenges we face in maintaining the competitive edge for combined cyber operations, and more importantly, how we can work together to address them specifically for the threats in the region. None of us can solve the problems we face individually, and these problems affect not just one of us, uh, but all of those who have a stake, and it's great to see all of them here. I'd like to take a little bit of time to discuss Indo-PACOM strategy for the Indo-Pacific, the nations, really, what I see as challenges facing this region, uh, specifically those in the cyber domain as opposed to other domains, and how we can work together to overcome that. And uh, as Monica mentioned, after that, I'd be happy to take a few questions of my choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, any good strategy starts with a clear articulation of end states, and President Trump gave us that last year during a trip to Vietnam when he called, when he outlined his vision of a truly free and open Indo-Pacific. But what does that phrase mean? It may seem self-evident, but let me offer a few thoughts on what we at Indo-PACOM believe when we say free and open Indo-Pacific. We mean free, both in terms of security, being free from coercion by other nations, and in terms of values and political systems. Free societies respect individual rights and liberties, free societies promote good governance, and free societies adhere to the shared values of the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Free also means nations are free to choose who they trade with and who they partner with, absent fear, or coercion. An open Indo-Pacific means we believe all nations should enjoy unfettered access to the seas and skies and cyberspace. All of our nations depend on these to foster connectivity and drive economic growth, after all. It also means open investment environments, transparent agreements between nations, defense of intellectual property rights, and fair and reciprocal trade all of which are essential for people, goods, and capital to move across borders to the shared prosperity and benefit of all. Free and open applies to all domains, land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. While the clarity of the vision is new, the core elements of a free and open Indo-Pacific are not. This vision for the region goes back over 240 years to the earliest days of our country alone. We have advanced this vision for more than two centuries because we are a Pacific nation. 
We have five Pacific states, Hawaii, California, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. We also have Pacific territories on both sides of the international dateline, like Guam, Wake, and the Northern Marianas. And we have compacts of free association with Micronesia, Palau, and the Marshall Islands. American businesses have traded in Asia since the 18th century, the nation's oldest treaty. In the region is a treaty of amity with Thailand that dates to 1833. The United States has been in this region for more than 200 years, and whenever we have moved to war in this region, it has been to liberate people, not to conquer them. The United States is an enduring Pacific power. That will not change, and we could not leave the region even if we wanted to. Our historical, cultural, structural, economic, and institutional ties to the Indo-Pacific are indelible. But even though America's vision for the region has not changed, some other things have. And most notably, there are a number of challenges that threaten the long-term visibility, excuse me, viability of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So let me take a few minutes to address some of the cybersecurity challenges specifically I see in the region. For decades, the United States has had the luxury of maintaining superiority in every operating domain. Air, land, sea, space, and now cyberspace are all domains that are contested. The relentless drive to develop new technologies ex is expanding to more actors with lower barriers of entry. Innovations and advancements in fields like artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, directed energy, and biotechnology will help ensure we are able to fight and win the wars of the future. But these very technologies that empower us to do great good can also be used to undermine us and inflict great harm. Oftentimes, when we think of coercion, we think in military terms, but increasingly, actors are looking to keep competition below the level of armed conflict, as is particularly evident in the cyber domain. Various actors look to exploit our dependencies and vulnerabilities in cyberspace and use them to weaken our democratic institutions to gain economic, diplomatic, and military advantage. This is a perfect example of the difference between our view of a free and open Indo-Pacific and our potential adversary's view of a closed and controlled cyberspace environment. They see cyberspace as an asymmetric area where they can damage U.S. prestige and credibility. I would add that in the information domain as well. And they can do so at low cost. Our cyber adversaries seek to infiltrate our critical infrastructure, including our electrical grid, so that in some future conflict, they might have the opportunity to shut down the nerve center of American energy and our way of life. Foreign interests also look to steal trade secrets from some of our most important industries. Many of you are sitting here today. Just a few weeks ago, the US Justice Department indicted 10 Chinese intelligence officers with conspiring to steal sensitive commercial aviation technological data. A separate US trade representative investigation found that for many years, China has directed bureaucrats and businesses to find and steal our nation's intellectual property and our advanced technologies, especially those pertaining to national defense. China also targets USDOD and clear defense contractor networks to fill gaps in its research programs and gather intelligence on our strategies and plans. North Korea continues to advance an aggressive cyber program targeting both the Republic of Korea and the United States. And we also, in this theater, see violent extremist organizations use social media as an effective messaging and recruitment platform. By furthering their agendas and spreading hateful ideologies, they continue to pose challenges to our national security. But these incursions are not just targeting the United States government and US companies, but they're doing it to our allies and partners as well. China has installed spyware and equipment and software sold to other countries in order to gather intelligence on their operations. China also uses their largest IT provider, Huawei, as an extension of their intelligence service through the One Belt, One Road initiative, 
offering equipment and improvements to infrastructure for free or reduced prices. But China is not offering this technology for benevolent means. They use Huawei gear to gain information about its users. Those concerns led Australia to ban them and fellow Chinese communications firm ZTE from providing 5G technology for Australia's wireless networks. Similarly, Australia offered more than $100 million in aid to prevent Huawei from building an underwater internet cable from the Solomon Islands to Australia. And in 2016, the same North Korean hackers responsible for the WannaCry ransomware attack, which affected more than 300,000 computers across 150 countries, they were suspected of the theft of $81 million from the Bank of Bangladesh. These are just a few of the examples of the current cyber threats to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, I know this audience has a good understanding of these challenges, and I'm sure you could come up with a long list of other examples, but the real question is, what are we going to do to confront them? The DOD cyber strategy says we must respond to these challenges by exposing, disrupting, and degrading cyber activity, threatening U.S. interests, and to strengthen the cybersecurity and resilience of our own potential targets. Our digital adversaries are taking advantage of all of us. They are exploiting our open society to steal, to manipulate, to intimidate, to coerce, to disrupt, to purchase, to buy, to sell, and to undermine. They are using our interconnectedness to attack us. But let's use the fact that we are all connected to our advantage. We must use a whole of society approach here, working together across industries, all levels of government, and alongside our allies and partners. Let me give an example of how we are working towards that here in Hawaii. Indo-PACOM's mission assurance is highly dependent on Hawaii's infrastructure and utilities, electric power, oil and natural gas, the ports, water and sewer. Thus, a targeted attack on critical infrastructure utilities could severely degrade our ability to protect the homeland and project force into the Indo-Pacific. This critical infrastructure is privately and municipally owned, meaning the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, state and local government, and the private sector are all codependent on each other for a whole of society approach to defend against any critical infrastructure cyber attacks against it. And to address this vulnerability, we are working through efforts like the state's Defense Cyber Industry Consortium pilot program, bringing several industry and municipal partners like Hawaiian Electric and the Honolulu Board of Water together to share information and strengthen our cyber defenses. This is the type of partnering and collaboration we need to see more of around the country and with our allies and partners. And we need this collective group's expertise and creativity in addressing complicated problem sets that affect all of us. And while we address these issues, I'd like to ask you to focus on three areas. First, everything we do at Indopaycom hinges on seamless integration with our allies and partners. So include them in your planning ways to focus on interoperability. We need to improve collective cybersecurity and the ability to work together in cyberspace during coalition operations. We have five treaty allies here in the Indo-Pacific, more than any other combatant commander area. We've got to be able to do cybersecurity together. Interoperability and releaseability with our allies and indeed partners is absolutely essential if we expect their contribution to be anything other than political, diplomatic, <coughs> or land, sea, and air. So please don't bring me US only solutions. So first, everything we do at Indo-PACOM hinges on seamless integration with allies and partners. Second, I'm looking for those capabilities and enabling technologies to conduct full spectrum cyber ops. All those pieces that let us plan, integrate, synchronize, direct, monitor, and assess, and then replan, full spectrum cyberspace operations. All those technologies that let us 
protect and enable our decision superiority while at the same time holding our adversary's information and decision-making capability at risk. Finally, third, last, we need to ensure essential command and control during contingency operations and, degraded, and in degraded or denied environments. Help us work through the challenge of balancing between protecting our secrets and plans, but also having the confidence that additional layers of security won't affect our systems in a time of need. So in closing, as the commander for Indo-PACOM, my singular focus is to ensure the U.S. forces under my command are prepared to prevent challenges to a free and open Indo-Pacific today, tomorrow, next month, next year, right. indeed Get over the long over term. And I know the challenges before us yeah, are daunting. We were speaking to some of these just a few moments ago Let's at my table, uh, but there's no doubt in my mind about what we're working toward or the importance of the mission. Most importantly, I'm optimistic about the future because I know we will confront these challenges alongside you in the room, our industry partners, academia, across all levels of our government, and again, with our allies and partners, so critical to us. In order to succeed in dealing with this threat, we must all take ownership of the challenge. We need to ask ourselves, are we doing enough as a whole to stay ahead of our adversaries? And with that in mind, I thank you for your attention, and I'd like to open it up to any questions I choose to answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have time for two questions this afternoon. The first one, how are you thinking about multi-domain operations as a joint leader? Listen, our operations in multi-domains uh, is required to, to enhance the maneuver of the force in all those domains. I was having this conversation briefly before lunch here today. If you'd have come out of World War I and we'd have had blogs and think tanks, You'd have said the rifled bullet, the trench, and the machine gun has made the infantrymen obsolete. Yet we spent some 25 years nearly um, perfecting how to deliver maneuver back to the infantry, right? We did this with logistics, sustainment, combined arms approach, air came to the message, communications, <laughs> all these multi-domain combined op operations approach restored maneuver of infantry, armor, and supporting arms of uh, artillery and made the free and open world you're all living in today absolutely possible. The same is true about the future. And whether you're talking about maneuver forces at sea, aircraft carriers, fourth generation fighters, expeditionary forces moving across the region to make them viable in their maneuver and ultimately make them winning formations, you are going to have to be able to synchronize multi-domain operations in a way that hasn't been done quite in the past. So there are new frontiers here, there's no doubt. But as I mentioned, I'm optimistic about the future, the focus on space, the focus on cyberspace, and our ability to exploit those for our own information domain dominance, whether that's deception, whether that's other jamming, whether that's other means, is going to be incredibly important. And it's going to restore maneuver to the force. That's how I think about it. Next. Thank you, sir. The second question. When will the DOD Navy budget be appropriated down to the program manager level for new procurement action? There's other people that answer that question here. Next. <laughs> Sir, that was our last question. Uh, Admiral <laughs> Mackey will be coming up to the stage to thank you. <laughs> Is that really it? Anybody here from Navy? You want to answer that question? <laughs> 
Yeah, all right, very good. Is that it? Is that truly all the questions? Yeah. Oh. Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, that was easy. Well, in, in consonance with all of the uh, DOD lawyers, we do not have anything to give you. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could humor me just for a few admin comments before you run off to the next fabulous event. Um, we have a couple items to run through. Uh, first, please download the APSIA 365 free app for details on panels and continuing education courses. Uh, second, the U.S. Indo-PACOM panel discussion on coalition interoperability will be at 2.30 p.m. in the South Pacific Ballroom. The second Women in APSIA panel is being held at 3 p.m. in the South Pacific Ballroom. More info is provided on the APSIA app. And then at 3.30, there will be an exhibitor-sponsored reception on the exhibit floor. For some uh, fun Wednesday evenings, uh, Powhana event tickets on the Great Lawn are still available at the registration desk. Um, please check the schedule and step by, stop by the tech, tech Talks in the Iolani Suites. And please don't forget to visit the STEM Innovation Showcase located upstairs in the South yeah, Pacific man. Ballroom yeah, so. 1 featuring St. Louis High School and their really cool robot. Um, and then last admin comment, uh, the APSIA Hawaii Educational Foundation is holding their annual golf tournament on Friday. And please sign up at the members room. All right, thank you.